Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. One friend away. If you're watching online and you're like, I'm not going to go to church this month because they're talking about friends and I've got 10,000 friends. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have a bunch of acquaintances, but we're talking about friends. We're talking about the ones who stick closer than a brother. We're talking about real friendships, real relationships. I want to tell you, we had a great weekend with the ladies. Our ladies' conference was this weekend. It was wonderful. We had two great guests who were here uh, preaching and teaching and sharing a lot of great information. Uh, men, do not miss out on the men's event. Okay, I understand that not all men think that they're outdoors kind of guys. But I'm telling you, something happens within every man when they pick up a compound bow and shoot it at a target. Something comes alive in you, all right? I'm just telling you, it's inside of every man, even if you're more of like the couch potato bookworm. You got to sign up for this event and come out, all right? Um, one more thing that I want to pitch to you guys real quick. Uh, I had a really busy week, a really great week, but I was uh, with Pastor Joel Osteen on Tuesday night. And he is hosting another, uh, it's called Return to Hope. And we are at Yankee Stadium, August 6th. It's a Saturday night. August 6th, Return to Hope with Joel Osteen. Uh, Torn Wells is going to be leading worship and CC Winans. It's going to be a great, great time. Uh, tickets are sale, uh, for sale on Ticketmaster.com and through his website and all those other kind of ways to get tickets. So uh, if you want to come out, I'll actually be on stage with him uh, again this year. It's exciting, exciting. And let me just tell you why. Let me just tell you why we do this, okay? Because I, I already got a little bit of a hate mail about it. Um, this will be the third event that I've done with Pastor Joel. And when he gets to the end of his sermon and does a salvation call, I promise you, 10,000 or more people will stand up and give their life to Jesus Christ. They will repent of their sins, they will confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they will accept them into their heart. They, I've never seen anything like it because I'm really sitting back and I'm like, dude, that was like a really lame salvation call. Like, there's nothing flashy about it, but the response he gets to the world is just staggering, staggering. So if you want to be part of that, it's August 6th down in Yankee Stadium. So we're talking about one friend away. And here's the thought. Here's the thought that's leading us through this series is you show me your friends and I will show you your future. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said it this way in Proverbs 13, 20. Those who walk with the wise will become what? wise, but a, a companion of fools suffers harm. There are some of us who hang out with some foolish people. We need to change rooms. We need to get some other friends, all right? So my key thought today is this. You might just be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. You might be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. And I believe that with all my heart. You may be one friend away, one friend away from changing your life and the direction of your life. I've seen it time and time again with people that join the church, make a friend, and all of a sudden they've got this godly friend and things change in their lives. And we see it in the Word of God as well. We're going to look at a couple people through Scripture. The first we're going to look at is the Apostle Paul. Do you guys understand and know that before his name was Paul, his name was Saul, right? Saul. God changed his name on the Damascus Road. But let's look at this in Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And when Saul, or Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. He tried to join the local church. But it wasn't good enough. Couldn't join the church. Had too much sin. Too bad. Lifestyle didn't line up with everybody else. I don't want that kind of person sitting next to me. This is Saul. 
not allowed in the church. Look at this. They did not want him with the disciples. They were afraid of him, not believing that he had really converted or that he was really a disciple. Okay? Now, if you don't know anything about Saul of Tarsus, he was an uh, enforcer of the law. In fact, he would kill Christians. And so they were thinking this was some kind of inside conspiracy thing, like Saul's going to try to come into our ranks, he's going to see who the leaders are, and then he's going to come in behind and kill us. Last week you're killing us, this week you want to join us. Some kind of conspiracy. This can't be. But watch this. Verse 27. But Barnabas. Say, but Barnabas. There's one person, one out of all of them, that says, let's give this guy a shot. Let's give this guy a chance. Let's listen if there's a change. Come on, church. How quick are we to say, nope, that person can't go to heaven. They're disqualified from heaven. How quick are we to judge because someone's sin looks different than ours? But Barnabas took him in and brought him to the apostles. Barnabas is putting his credibility, his reputation on the line, vouching for Saul. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Watch. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Because one friend said, yeah, come on, hang out with me. One friend made room for him at the table. One friend made room for him in a place that no one else wanted him. And what happened? One good friend one changed Paul's course, Paul's destiny. Now, now the guy has access to the, all the apostles and traveling with them. He writes one, uh, what, over half of the New Testament books that we now study and know today. One friend. Now look at the result. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. We need some friends so they can protect us. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and it increased in number. It increased in number. The kingdom advanced because of proper friendships and callings. And this, is, this story is true for every single one of you. You literally may be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. What I want to do for the rest of this time together is I want to talk about three types of friends that we all need in our lives. Three types of friends that we all need in our lives. And maybe today you can point out one of these types of friends that you don't yet have in your life. Is that all right? The first we're going to look at today is this man named Samuel. Samuel, if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's the kind of friend you need. We all need a friend who makes you better. We all need a friend who makes you better. Makes you better. Makes you better. I don't want friends who are trying to push me places they've never gone. I want friends who pull me to what they've already experienced. Do not take financial advice from someone who's broke. <laughs> Do not get marriage counseling from someone who's been divorced nine times. Don't do it. It don't make no sense. You don't know what's up. You know how to fix this and do it the right way. Come on. Do not surround yourself with people who are pushing you to be something, but they don't know how to mentor you or coach you to do those things. We all need a friend who makes you better. Can I be honest in my life? Because I am so driven Sometimes, now hear me, hear, hear my heart behind this. Sometimes you got to buy that friend. I know, I know, I know that wasn't going to go over very well. 
I know it wasn't going to go very well. I had to hire a coach. I had to hire a business coach. I had to put my money where my mouth was. I said, I want to get better. I want to learn something, right? Like right now, I'm in school, paying my way through college again. I'm a full-time college student again. I'm paying to be in a room with people who are smarter than me. That's what college is, by the way, right? You're paying for a mentor. You're paying for a coach to get you to that next stage in your life. Now, I know, well, if they're really my friend, then I'm not going to take my money. No, put your money where your mouth is. Listen to what I'm telling you right now. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be found also. You can't say that you love something and you ain't invested in it. You can't say you want to go somewhere and be something and you ain't invested in it. It ain't possible, right? Your money's in that next vacation. And you know, three weeks leading up to that vacation, your heart is already in Maui. <laughs> your heart already been there, right? Because your treasure's there. I ain't that. You know how much I got in that vacation? I am going, right? Come on, somebody. Now, I'm not saying that you have to always buy that person who makes you better. I'm not saying it that way. And, and if you heard me in some kind of cocky, arrogant way, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying sometimes if you're that person sitting back and saying, I don't have anybody who can make me better, then hire a coach. Hire, you can at least do that. I'm just giving you all levels. I'm saying you could come out to the women's conference, the men's event, and you can connect with someone who you think is in that next stage of life who is maybe at a successful place or has a better marriage or whatever than you, that can help you and show you how to be better, all right? Now, we're talking about King Saul, Samuel, King Saul, David. This is a different Saul than the Saul we just talked about. This is King Saul in the Old Testament. And God got to a point where he rejected Saul. He's like, Saul, I've tried, I'm done. And he takes his Holy Spirit off of him. And he says, I'm anointing a new king. And he sends Samuel to the house of Jesse to look for the next king that he has already anointed. And obviously Jesse takes his oldest son, his strongest son, his tallest son. He says, absolutely, it's got to be my firstborn boy. And he stands before Samuel and Samuel says, nope, not it. Okay, then it's my second son, not it. Goes through the whole house, not it, not it, not it. The boy's here. The king is here, but he's not in this room. Jesse's like, well, I ain't got nobody else. Like, there's no other sons. And if you really want to study this out, the reason why David was never really an option was because he was an illegitimate son. He wasn't a purebred son. He was like the redheaded stepchild son. You know what I'm saying? So he's out in the field. He's out in the field, tending his dad's sheep. He didn't qualify to actually even be in the house because he wasn't a purebred son. Study it out. Study out who God decides to use. The Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He says, I rejected him. He goes out. He gets David. He says, yes, this is the one. Watch this. 1 Samuel 16, 12 so he sent for him. He had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and was handsome. Single ladies, say amen. Okay. <laughs> I think there's some married ladies who do that too. <laughs> then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brother. anoints the next king, the illegitimate brother. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel went on to Ramah. And what's interesting to me is this. Not a single person who saw in David what God allowed Samuel to see in him. There was not a single person who saw in David what Samuel saw in him. Some of us need that friend that's like, bro, I see something in you, hon, I see something in you. We just got to get some of this other stuff out of the way and kind of refine the fire. We got to pull out the diamond in the rough and work on it. I had a teacher in middle school like that. I was like kind of a real bad student. I graduated high school with a 68 GPA. 
<laughs> 68 GB. Just made it. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't because I was dumb. Because I didn't care. You know, in that generation, that, yo, our high school was kind of wild in that generation. It was pretty, pretty wild. Anyway, I had this one teacher, and uh, she, she brought my parents in for like one of them student teacher meetings, whatever, and she's like, you know, I know that Michael's not doing all that great in class, classy, but he's a diamond in the rough. And she gave me like tasks, like cleaning the chalkboards and straightening the classroom. And she gave me some extra things because she knew that I was ADHD and I couldn't just sit there and learn. And then she let me take tests in, 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 you know, private by myself and not on like a time limit where I had to sit there and get all nervous. And she spent this time with me because she saw something that all the other teachers, I don't have time for this kid. I don't have time for this energy. Teachers, I'm talking to you. Maybe you can see those kids that just need that little extra moment, that little extra time. Samuel saw something in him. He says, I'm choosing this. I'm choosing him. And through Samuel seeing this and through God calling him, David becomes one of the greatest kings that Israel has ever seen. Has your mom or dad ever said this? You are who you hang with, you are who you hang with, the kind of people you hang with will rub off on you. The friends that kind of bring you down, that are kind of like, uh, chances are those kind of friends that really aren't enhancing your life happen accidentally. The friendships that are actually enhancing your life and making you better, most likely did not happen accidentally. They happened intentionally. You saw somebody, you saw something, or they saw something in you, and they wanted what you had, or you wanted what they had, and there was an intention behind it. I'm just saying, maybe we need to be a little bit more intentional about the next season and where we're growing in our lives. It wasn't by accident that Samuel was going to make David better. You might just be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. Here's what I want to ask you. Do you have someone in your life right now who makes you better? Who makes you better? Who makes you better? If not, it might be time to find the friend that makes you better. Do you have the friend that makes your marriage better? If you're hanging around a bunch of people with bad marriages, it's not going to make your marriage better. If you're hanging around a bunch of people that all you do, guys, when you get together is just trash your spouses, it ain't going to make your marriage better. Okay. Hopefully that's helping somebody. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. If you're hanging around a bunch of people who are divorced, Shondo. If you're hanging around a bunch of people who eat really bad, you're going to eat really bad. It's, it's just a fact, all right? It's just, who's making you better? Who's making you better? At the same time, God wants to help you find those friends to make you better. He is leading that. So maybe, maybe you're a more introverted person and it's hard for you to go out and do that. I get it. But ask for strength. Lord, help me. There's somebody that I saw at church, or there's somebody I saw at a conference, or someone I see at work, that, that they're kind of like a role model to me. Lord, give me the courage to go and say hi to them and make friends with them. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron. Say it with me. Iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Someone who makes you better. Someone who makes you sharp. David had a friend named Jonathan. Jonathan was Saul's son, King Saul's son. King Saul was coming after David was going to kill him. The king's own son was David's friend. And that brings us to the second kind of friend we need. We all need a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. We all need a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. We all need a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. 
Every single one of us who follow Christ need others who will help you find spiritual strength in the Lord. Can I be transparent with you guys? We're in this conference and this lady said that we, we need to be, um, what was her wording? We need to be honest or transparent with many and only vulnerable with a few, but I'm be vulnerable for a moment with everybody, all right? Just kind of who I am. Uh, had a great week, like mountaintop week. I was on, I was interviewed by Joel Osteen on XM Radio live this week. Like I was so like living, all, like I was on cloud nine, like, yeah, oh, this is amazing. The next day I'm driving down the road and I begin to see myself putting the gas pedal to the floor and driving 120 miles an hour into a tree. I saw myself like unhook my seatbelt. I like, I, I envisioned the whole thing, unhooking my seatbelt and I saw what would happen when my car hit the tree and I could envision going through the windshield. And, and all of a sudden, like, I'm not suicidal, I'm not feeling anything like that, but I've, I almost felt it calling to me. It was like, not only could you do this, like, yo, let's do this. I'm, I'm on a mountaintop, I'm feeling good, I had a great week, what is this? Caught this anxiety attack. Caught this anxiety attack in the middle of the car, my chest is shaking, I can't breathe, I have to pull over. I pull over, I call one of my best friends, I'm like, dude... I don't know what's happening right now. Like, I don't even know what's going on right now. He's like, how much coffee are you drinking this week? And I'm like, 10 gallons a day? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> kind of talking me off the ledge and like, you know, what's going on? Let's, let's go through some stuff. I get back to the office and I'm shook. I'm like still shook because I'm like, what's going on? Like, my chest is tight. I can't breathe. What, what, what's happening right now? And sit down with my team and I'm like, Someone asked me, are you all right? I'm like, no, I'm not. This is what just happened. And a couple of staff members and a couple of volunteers and a couple of family members, they just kind of move their chairs close, lay their hands and pray. And take authority over that. Play, pray strength. Do you have a friend? Do you have a friend that in a moment isn't just going to be like, oh, dude, that sucks. <laughs> Who can you call that can throw down on a prayer at any given time that you need prayer. Do you have the friend that can be there for you spiritually? A strong spirit will sustain you bodily, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? So when your spirit is wounded, or when you do feel down, can you lean into a friend who will lift you up spiritually? 1 Samuel 23, 15 and 16, while David was at Horesh, in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. He didn't just sit there and listen to him complain. He didn't just sit there and take on David's offense. Yeah, let's get out. Let's go kill my dad. He didn't do that. He said, bro, we need to pray. We need to make a sacrifice. We need to bring this to the Lord. And he lifted him up and helped him in the Lord. He prayed for him. He Do you have that friend that helps you find spiritual strength? Because I don't care how spiritually mature you think you are. I preach 45 times a year. When you have a moment that your mind is going wild on you, you need someone who can speak into your spirit. Someone who can speak into your spirit. We're all going to be tempted. We're all going to have emotional days. We're all going to question things around us. Who can you call in that moment? I'm not, to, listen, listen, listen. We don't need a friend that's going to say, all right, I'll pray for you. Listen, if anybody tells you that, they're not actually going to ever pray for you. And if you say that, shame on you because you know you're not going to pray for them. 
I'm going to keep you in prayer. Someone posts something really upset on Facebook, and you put the little hands. They assume that that meant you're praying. You didn't say nothing. You hit the emoji button. Don't be no dang liar. Don't tell somebody praying for you, keeping you in prayer, and you ain't never said a single word for them. You're a liar. No, you don't need a friend that's going to pray for you. You need a friend that's going to pray with you. A friend that's going to pray with you. No, no, how about you pray with me right now? Right now? Let's pray right now. Well, I didn't really mean I was going to pray for you. I was going to think about it in my head. I really meant I was going to think about you for about 30 seconds, and then I was going to forget about you. That's what you really meant when you said, I'm going to pray for you. Because most of us don't even pray at all, let alone going to pray for somebody. Now, how about we stop right now and you pray with me? Pray with me. Hold my hand. Touch me. Let's connect. Maybe you don't have that friend in person, but FaceTime. No, no, don't call me. Don't let me just hear. Let me see your face. Connect with me in prayer. We're going to look for those friends that make us better. We're going to look for those friends that bring spiritual strength. And finally, we're going to look at this guy named Nathan in the, in the life of David. We all need a friend who's going to tell us the truth. We're all going to need a friend. We all need a friend who's going to tell us the truth. Now, I'll tell you, I need friends. I need friends who are going to tell me the raw truth. The raw truth. I don't need no sugar coating stuff. Like, I need it. Like, listen, I don't need friends who are going to sit there and watch me talk to them with a booger in my nose <laughs> and not tell me I got a booger in my nose. Come on, somebody. Sit there and watch me talk. I got food stuck in my beard, and you don't got no guts to tell me, hey, just. Like, you can give me a little. Give me something, but don't let me stand there and be all awkward. You didn't give me a heads up. Tell me the truth, man. Tell me the truth. If I got up and I, and I gave a fact that wasn't accurate because I heard somebody else give a fact, that they heard somebody else give a fact, but we didn't really do our research and we just talk it out our face. Come on. People love hearing their opinions, but what's the fact? What's the words? What's the data? Who's going to tell you the truth? Who's going to tell you when you're ranting and raving about your point of view? Say, dude, you're wrong. You're wrong. You got a friend that can tell you you're wrong? And I'm not talking about your spouse. Because you're always wrong to your spouse. <laughs> Those things, it's very hard for that to be that sort of person. I'm talking about another guy. Let me talk to the men for a second. Listen, as much as wives feel the need and really do aspire and want to give their, wor their husband words of affirmation, only a man can affirm another man, truly affirm another man. Now, wives, yes, you can 100% affirm us in the bedroom. Affirm us all day long. Tell us. Come, oh, can, we can't be for real in church. I'm trying to help somebody right now. You better affirm him right then and there, right? But when it comes to the things like, am I a good man? Am I a provider? Am I working hard? Am I enough? Our wives always say, hey, baby, you're the best. You're the greatest. You're everything. But there's something about when another man comes along and says, bro, you're killing it. You're crushing it. You're crushing it at life right now. You're going after it, man. I'm so proud of you. You're doing so awesome. Females, I don't really know the psyche of it. Because I think sometimes with the women, they don't even believe it when they are affirmed. Ah, oh, stop it. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Wait, tell me more. Tell me No, I'm not. Stop. <laughs> but do you have a friend who's going to tell you the truth? 
I'll tell you the truth. And here's what happened with David. You know, David is called the man after God's own heart. And God was pleased with him. But for a brief moment, David took his eyes off the Lord. And he saw Bathsheba. Bathsheba bathing. Bathsheba. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Had her husband killed. And he put the whole kingdom at risk. And in that moment, he didn't see the gravity of his decision. He didn't see it because he just saw what he wanted. And God sent a man called Nathan to tell him the truth. And Nathan sat down with him and he said, David, I want to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was this really wealthy guy and he had sheep and cattle. So many he couldn't even count. And there was this really poor guy, dirt poor, had a little lamb. Most important pet to him. And one day a traveler came and was hungry, and so the wealthy man didn't use any of his own livestock, but he went and took that little poor lamb, that that poor guy's lamb, slaughtered it, and gave it to the traveler. David was like, How can he do that? He's wicked and he's evil. That's the worst thing ever. This guy should pay for that. And Nathan said, You're right. You're that man. And it's the word ataish. Altaish is the word that Nathan says. Altaish, you are that man. You are that man. You see, Nathan loved the king enough to tell him the truth, even though the king could have killed him for it. A lot of us don't tell each other the truth because we are sorely codependent. I'm not going to tell you the truth because I don't want you to yell at me. I'm not going to tell you the truth because I know you're going to have an attitude. You're not going to talk to me for three weeks. We all need to grow up. We all need some emotional health. You are not perfect. You have not arrived. You got problems. Listen, can, can I tell you, can I just talk to somebody real quick, man? If someone comes up to you and tells you you're an addict, you have a problem, you have an addiction, Instead of getting angry, because every addict gets angry when someone tells them the truth. Take one minute and say, is there truth to this statement? Is there truth to this statement? Do I have a problem? Because by the time someone else has to tell you you have a problem, you have a really, really bad problem. I'm just trying to help somebody today. I'm talking about having friends, man. The Bible says, and suddenly David saw what he hadn't seen before, and he was brokenhearted before God. I I did that. I did that. I'm, I'm that guy. I'm doing that. I'm hurting other people that way. I've become that selfish. I've become that blinded. I've become that arrogant, that ego. Me? Repented before the Lord. Psalm 51, if you ever want to take some time and read it, is one of David's accounts of one of his repentances. And he prayed with Nathan after Nathan confronted him. And I want to ask you now, I want to ask you this. When is the last time you've been with a friend that loved you enough to tell you you're wrong? To tell you, don't go there. That's stupid. Don't do that. That's not the right choice for you. Don't do that. You're going to hurt somebody. Don't go there. That's going to hurt your testimony. Don't do that. You're going to break your own heart. We need a friend who's going to tell us the truth. On the flip side, we need a friend who's going to tell us the truth and say, you're living so far beneath your potential. Go for it. Jump out. Take a chance. Go for the promotion. You've got the goods. The friend who's calling out the best in you, calling out the truth in you that you might not see yourself. You might be one friend away from changing the course 
of your destiny. And just let me kind of close out with this. And if you give me a little bit of permission to be dramatic. Some of you will never become who God wants you to be. If you keep surrounding yourself with relational poverty. Some of us will never become what God calls to be when we keep hanging around with the same bum friends that are bringing you down and not making you better. Some of you, your relational capacity is so big that maybe you need to open up your friend group to let more people in. Maybe you can be the leader of that group that brings up the others around you. You might be one friend away from having the best marriage of your life. You may be one friend away from becoming the parent that you always wanted to be. Maybe you're one friend away from being more generous than you ever thought you would be. Maybe you're one friend away of overcoming addiction that you've been trying to get past for years. Maybe you're one friend away from waking up with a divine purpose for living for a higher calling. You could just be one friend away. If you show me your friends, I promise I can show you your future. But here's the one thing that I know that God said. It is not good that man be alone. It is not good that man be alone. And in that moment, man even had God at that time. He had full access to God. And God says, yo, as much as I love this relationship with you and it's just me and you, it's not enough. You need another friend like you. But I would also say this, don't be stuck on trying to find someone who's like you. Don't be stuck on your same demographic, your same age, your same stage. Some of my greatest friends are a lot older than me. A lot wiser than me. Have stuff to add to me. I've got friends that are a lot younger than me that are saying, hey, Pastor Mike, show me how you got to where you're at. What did you do? What kind of work ethic? What kind of books are you reading? Come on. Both sides. Married, single, whatever. Different stages. Different backgrounds. Different socioeconomic backgrounds. Different cultural backgrounds. In fact, I'll tell you this. I don't actually have too many white friends. <laughs> it just is what it is. If you look at your friends, look at, look, at, look at the groups of people you constantly find yourselves hanging out with. Who are you attracted to? What kind of rooms are you called to? But there's one that you'll never be fully satisfied without having him in your relational life, and that's God. He's that friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's that friend who literally laid down his life for you. He gave his life so that you could eternally be in relationship with him. He literally put his money where his mouth was. He literally put his life where his words were. He said, I want to be with you for all eternity. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to begin a relationship with God, we'd like to offer that to you today. We do that by praying a prayer, and that prayer goes like this if you would all join me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you fill out the online connect card? One of our online hosts would love to send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me real quick and say, Pastor Mike, that's me. I prayed that prayer for the very first time today. Anybody at all as I look across the room? We're all, we're all family today. Praise God. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 
If you are ever interested in that starting point book, our care team members have them. If you're still on the fence, saying, I'd like to just know more about Christianity. We have a book at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home that is free of charge to you. If you came in here today and you need prayer for any reason, we will have care team members in the front and in the back of the room available for prayer today. Father, we thank you that your word will never return void. It will accomplish exactly what you set it for to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit for strengthening us, equipping us, opening doors of friendship. Help us to be bold enough and vulnerable enough to step out to make friends. Lord, I pray for the men that are going to come to the June 10th event, that we will make lasting friendships, that they make connections and a brotherhood that will, will be like a three-stranded cord that's not easily broken. Lord, everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love ya. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.